Lynn Brittner, the Executive Director. Welcome, everyone. I really want to especially um, thank all of you that are members of our institution. If you're not, please become one. We have membership brochures outside. I also want to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors, um, both for the exhibit and for this lecture. We have uh, Bella Vista Designs. Thank you so much. Um, Ann and Gary Nett, the Voss Family Foundation, and the Orfala Foundation, Union Bank, and Elena Van Cott. If it wasn't for the support of these organizations, we couldn't be doing this. So thank you very much. Um, just a <laughs> So without further ado, I would like to talk about our speaker. Um, Neil first gave voice to history in 1989, and I'm going to be learning more about Neil also as, we, as, we, as I tell you this, when he premiered a slideshow on the Santa Barbara history. Encouraged by the responses, more talks developed, and currently there are 20 different topics that have been presented, well over 300 shows. He has numerous appearances on local, state, national radio, and TV, including Hell Hazards, California Gold, KCET TV, Life and Times, This Old House. And also, he's been featured in several documentaries, including the Emmy Award-winning Impressions in Time. He will be giving autographs at the end of his lecture. He has authored numerous articles and monographs for historical organizations, including his own Historic Santa Barbara. His books are top sellers, and we are selling them in our very own gift shop. Neil has served as board members in the Santa Barbara Historical Museum in the past. He's also been the chairman of the Santa Barbara County Landmarks Commission, board members of the Mission Canyon Association, and president of the Westerners. He is also a founding member of the De La Guerra y Pachero Chapter 1.5 of the Ancient and Honorable Order of E. Clampus Vitus. <laughs> I know about that organization. And he is an ex noble grand humbug <laughs> of that esteemed organization. Um, for fun, Neil collects memorabilia, postcards, plays guitar, and enjoys cruising around town in an unrestored 1941 Packard. 180 limousine. So without further ado, Mr. Neil Graffy. Thank you, Lynn. Um, today's talk is the Great Santa Barbara Earthquake of 1925, the disaster that built a city. And it's not only the name of this talk, it's also the name of a forthcoming book which is getting close to production. And I'd like to introduce Anna Lafferty over there in the corner. She's my designer. She also does uh, Aaron's books as well. And just a quick plug, those of you, those of you who have seen Aaron's new book about the Spanish Renaissance in Santa Barbara, going through the local or going through the, all the tile work and the art things, she just won two prizes with the, with her book. So um, my new book will get three prizes, Aaron. So. <laughs> Ah, here we go. I'm mixing up the wrong notes. I just want to read one quick thing. So I have this new book. And I'm going to read the opening page from that book. We live on what we believe is terra firma. Our houses rest on solid foundations. Our cars roll along smooth asphalt ribbons. And unless seriously inebriated, our feet tread on steady ground. Yet beneath our homes, cars, feet, and even the ocean, all is in motion. It's trouble with looking away from these things. Our seemingly solid world is comprised of many plates floating on the Earth's molten core. Here along the west coast of the United States, the massive Pacific and North American plates are slotting past and into each other. Where these two plates meet is visibly demonstrated by the San Andreas Fault. The San Andreas Fault runs about 800 miles in a nearly straight line from Mexico to San Francisco, then up along the coast and into the Pacific. The part that is not the nearly straight line is the part that concerns us. <laughs> it is this bend right along there. 
It is this bend that disrupts the happy northward slide of the Pacific plate and instead causes the two plates to connect somewhat in head-on fashion, resulting in tremendous pressure that produces lateral faults and severe uplifting of the land. A direct result of this upheaval is a mountain range which runs east and west, a rather unusual geological feature. This range, known as the San Inez Mountains, blocks out cold air flowing down from the north and draws in the cool Pacific breezes, creating a delightfully moderate climate for the land along its southern base. Settled some 15,000 years ago, this land has been known for the past two centuries as Santa Barbara. Oddly enough, its climate and beauty, both natural and man-made, are the direct result of what its inhabitants fear the most. Quote, the occasional energy release on a massive scale when the pressure of colliding land masses proves too great, end of quote, or simply stated, the earthquake. Now the Chumash, they knew what caused earthquakes. The world of man was supported on the backs of two serpents, and when the serpents got tired and shifted about, that caused the land to shake. Other cultures have the same sort of uh, idea about this. In Japan, they believe that the islands rest on the back of carp, or catfish, and there is a god who controls the catfish and keeps them happy. If he gets distracted, the catfish move around and the islands shake. In Siberia, they believe that the world is on the back of a sled pulled by huskies. When the huskies stop to scratch their fleas, the world shakes, and on it goes. And in America, there are two tribes that camp along the mighty Potomac River. One tribe believes if the other tribe raises taxes, all calamity will befall mankind. The other believes if they lower taxes, the earth will shake and all will die. <laughs> Luckily, those two tribes have been kept in check, and so nothing has happened from that. The first recorded earthquake in California came about in 1769 with the first land expedition by the Portola, Expe the Portola Expedition, led by the first governor of California. In August of 1769, they were in the Los Angeles Basin, and several severe earthquakes shook, and so they were you know, writing, writing about it and marveling. The next day, they came across these large pools of tar, which were bubbling and oozing to the surface, and they wondered if this tar, this oil substance, was what was causing earthquakes. So they were about as close to reality as the Chumash were with their belief. So obviously, they were walking across the Brea tar pits. Well, some 13 years, two governors, and six missions later, the Santa Barbara Presidio was founded in 1782. Four years later, Mission Santa Barbara was founded. As if to give the new inhabitants time to relax and get used to the place, there were no earthquakes until 1800. Then a massive jolt shook California, felt all the way as far south as San Diego and up through the channel through Santa Barbara. In 1806, another earthquake hit Santa Barbara and caused great damage to the Presidio Chapel. And those were just teasers, getting California ready for what they would call the year of the earthquakes, 1812. On December 8, 1812, an earthquake hit Southern California. It destroyed Mission San Juan Capistrano, killing 40 parishioners that were inside the church. It damaged Mission San Gabriel. It was felt at Mission San Buenaventura, but surprisingly, Mission San Fernando, between Gabriel and Buen Buen San Buenaventura, didn't feel anything. The next earthquake was probably located off the channel, off Santa Barbara, and that earthquake on December 21st destroyed uh, Mission La Parisima, which, is, which was originally in what is now the city of Lompoc. It heavily damaged Mission Santa Inez, San Buenaventura, and also heavily damaged Mission Santa Barbara. Now this is what Mission Santa Barbara was looking like at the time. They had just finished making a new facade for the church there, and they had just built this, the nice 16 arched cor uh, corridor that we have today with this beautiful open patio along the top. Well, with the church destroyed, they had to start all over again. And so they were thinking, well, what can we do? Well, luckily, they had a very nice library. And in the library was a book of architecture done by a guy back in the BC days. His name was Vitruvius. And so from this book of architecture, they went through the pagan temples and through the, went through the designs. And they picked design B for the front of Mission Santa Barbara. Then they found another portrait which has statues on the corners of the pediment, and they said, aha. So they put these elements together, and in 1820, they opened the new Mission Santa Barbara. Of course, every architect builds on what another architect does, so doing better than Vitruvius, they had faith, hope, and charity, and then they added St. Barbara in the center, so they got an extra statue out of it. They also covered over the open patio, they put a tile roof over it, and they also, you notice, they're missing a tower. 
the tower came in in the early 1830s and then collapsed, and so they built, rebuilt that section of the mission, and that's why there's a buttress across the base of the mission today that covers up half of that 16th, or, uh, yeah, 16th arch. Well, uh, eventually the church looked like this as it went through various modifications. Well, these priests had no idea that their work on this book, pulling out an old pagan architect's uh, temple designs and applying it to this, what the impact would be on the future of California's architecture. But we'll leave them behind for the year of 1857. Uh, in the 1850s, there was a number of earthquakes, the 30s and 40s, not too many, but in the 1850s, we started getting a couple of really good shakes. And finally, on January 9th, 1857, a massive earthquake, known to be the largest earthquake recorded in, in California's history, known as the Fort Tejon earthquake, uh, hit. It was about eight point plus on the Richter scale. And some of the things that it did, it flung the Los Angeles River completely out of its banks. It emptied the Tulare Lake up in Kern County. Uh, some river, I forget where, ran backwards. And here you can see the offset. In, in, uh, at Fort Tejon, there was a corral, which you know is like in the shape of a square or the letter O. And it was the letter S by the time the earthquake was done with it. And you can certainly see here, here's a creek, how far off, uh, offset that creek is. And that's a result of that 1857 Fort Tejon quake. And of course, there is a movie opening tonight or tomorrow called San Andreas. As for Santa Barbara, the earthquake was felt here. It didn't do a lot of damage, but the newspaper recorded that it went, uh, the first shock rolled for about a minute. So you think that's a long time rocking back and forth. And it was so steady and so strong that they wrote that the Mission Reservoir was emptied on all four sides, the water just sloshing out and running down the street. Uh, but the, most of the adobes did pretty good during the earthquake. There was cracks, but not a lot of substantial damage. So this is Santa Barbara in the 1850s, around just a little bit before the time of the Fort Tejon earthquake. And this is sort of the last look at our adobe Santa Barbara. One thing I'd like to show you over here in the corner, this little building has a cross on it. That's Our Lady of Sorrows Church at the corner of Figueroa and State. When they built this, they put the front of the church out towards State Street, actually over the intended line of State Street. But the church was so far on the outskirts of Santa Barbara, the city council thought, well, we're never going to build up that far, so, and if we ever do, we'll, we'll worry about it later on. No problem. So this is the, sort of the last of our Adobe era, and things are beginning to change. We're getting a lot of people moving into Santa Barbara. During the Mexican-American War, there was a lot of different uh, military men came out here. They stayed in California, didn't want to go back to that freezing cold New York. We also had the gold rush, which brought people in. And so as they started coming into Santa Barbara, they're looking at these adobes, and they're old, dark, dingy, and falling apart. Well, maybe because they're really old, and after neglect, they start to happen. One, th one of the things that happens, the water drops off the roof there and starts backsplashing against the adobe. So it starts wearing away, cavitating along there. The walls get weak and collapse. And also, as women were coming out now, because there was men out here, uh, they looked at these adobes and thought, ew, these are dark and dirty. We don't like that. Well, when they were building the adobes, they really didn't have much choice. There wasn't a lot of wood around here. So the oaks and the sycamores turned out to be bad building materials, and the pines were way back in the Santianez, too, a little too far to carry. So they, you know, used what they could, which was adobe. But it takes a while. You've got to get the adobe. You've got to mix it. Then you've got to put it in the form. Then you've got to put the brick on its side. Then it's got to dry. Then you've got to flip it onto the other side. So if it's a rainy season, you're not going to build anything. And it takes a while to, do, to build an adobe. Well, with all these new people coming into California, industries were just blooming. And up in Santa Cruz were all these beautiful redwood trees and a lumber industry started up there and they started getting lumber shipped down and up and down the coast. So now Santa Barbara was getting deliveries of wood. So how fast is it to put up a nice little tiny cottage like this, probably a three room cottage, outhouse in the back, or perhaps a mansion like the Mortimer Cook Mansion, which is still over on Chapala Street. So this was changing Santa Barbara rapidly. Uh, we always think that Stern's Wharf is what brought the lumber to Santa Barbara, but as early as 1855, we had our first lumber yard and two lumber yards by 1857. So lumber was coming into Santa Barbara, House, wooden houses were being built, but we also had another feature from the earth, brick. And we don't think of Santa Barbara as being a brick town, but we were a huge brick town. In the 1850s, they discovered that there was a great deposit of clay below what is now City College in the Ladera Street Apartments, that where there's a hill cut in there towards McKinley School. 
That hill used to be a lot larger, and they just cut into it, and they were baking hundreds of thousands of bricks. So here we have the Coat of Knox adobe, which, or uh, house, which is just up the street from us. You can't tell it's covered with so much white paint, but it is a nice, beautiful brick building. The St. Vincent's Orphanage on De La Vina, another great example of local brick building a three-story building. And so State Street, while we had all that wood for a lot of the residences, along the business corridor, brick and all this nice heavy ornamentation lined the street. So this is Santa Barbara in the 1870s, heavily bricked. And one of the reasons they liked brick so much is that if there's a fire, you're not going to lose too much. You might lose some framework inside, but you've still got the shell of the building and you can keep on going. This is Our Lady of Sorrows Church by 1867. That church I showed you earlier had burnt down. How they burn an adobe down, I don't know. But they burned down, they burned down an adobe, and so they built this one. And they were probably kind of not happy. This one now faces Figueroa Street, and it's all made out of adobe. And they probably thought they made a mistake because just two years later, Santa Barbara was getting a growing Protestant congregation. And by 1869, we had at least three Protestant churches this one here at the corner of Anacapa and Montecito Street, the Episcopal Church with this beautiful tower. Those of you who have seen the lovely uh, Hayward and Moselle panoramas of Santa Barbara were taken from the tower of that church. We also had just behind us here the Congregational Church. The back end of it faced Coda Street. This side here faced uh, towards the ocean. And all of these things, this was uh, the Presbyterian Church in the 1100 block of state just below Anapamu. This one done by architect Peter Barber. And so all these beautiful brick buildings with gorgeous ornamentation and these towers reaching high into the heavens. And the Catholics had this little squat, you know, adobe thing. <laughs> but to keep up with the uh, Protestants, the Catholics remodeled Our Lady of Sorrows in, in the early 1880s. And they lined it, of course, with brick. So it's still the adobe inside. And they just simply took a bunch of brick and put a veneer over the building. They made these two bases for bell towers. They didn't have a bell tower yet, but they got ready for it, putting these two big bases on it. So the Catholics were able to modernize and keep up, though they didn't have a tall spire reaching high enough into the heavens. But uh, since we had Franciscans and Jesuits, we were obviously saved anyway. <laughs> Keeping along those lines, the city of Santa Barbara built this city hall in the center of what is now De La Guerra Plaza out of brick. Downstairs was the fire department, so the horses were inside of there. Upstairs was the city hall, so that way manure was spread equally throughout the building. <laughs> Over at uh, where the current courthouse is, this was, the, this was an adobe courthouse, and you can see that adobe courthouse, by the way, in my book, Santa Barbara Then and Now, available at the gift shop. Isn't that right? <laughs> Thank you. So the 1870s, they built a courthouse, Peter Barber again being our architect. And look at this one. This is straight out of Vitruvius's book of architecture on Roman temples. In 1889, they added a hall of records because Santa Barbara was getting bigger. But if you look at this, this looks like something that was plugged out of uh, Vermont or upstate New York. Yeah. I just got back from a, a tour of upstate New York and going with the, through the train through these little towns, it just looked like this town after town you could see this type of stuff. So this is what State Street looked like by the 1890s. And there was a lot of people that were starting to realize what we were losing. We were losing the adobes. We were losing this. The missions were decaying and melting away. And there were voices that were calling for preservation of these things. But still, Santa Barbara looked like someplace back east. Well, to the rescue came a man named Arthur Page Brown. At the Chicago Exposition, the Chicago World's Fair of 1893, each state had to have its own building. Arthur Page Brown chose Mission Santa Barbara, what the Padres had pulled out of that old pagan architect book, as the basis for the California State Building. He is credited with inventing what we now call the Mission Revival style, thanks to the 1812 earthquake and our uh, Pod Franciscan Padres. Right on the heels of building this in 1890, fall of 1893, the Midwinter Exposition in San Francisco, he designed the Manufacturing and Liberal Arts Building, which is this one right here for the foreground, again with this Morris design. And if you take a look at this nice rounded dome here and these arches, Mission and State, the new subway and 7-Eleven. They have, <laughs> everybody wonders, they think it's a Moorish temple or something and you go, well, it dates back to this sucker right here. This is where they got the idea from. Well, right after doing this particular building, 
A man named William Crocker of San Francisco, son of the Crocker, hired uh, Arthur Page Brown to come to Santa Barbara, where he built Santa Barbara's first tract home. The first development in Santa Barbara, some of you can't see it down here, there's five little houses, and what are they called? Crocker Row. Crocker Row. Way to go. And of course, here's Crocker Cottage number one, with the uh, ever faithful dog over here in the corner. So now this, this style is, is, is coming into California thanks to Mr. Brown and the Mission Revival style. And everybody thinks that we started getting all this uh, stucco and red tile after the earthquake. 1901, this is Los Banos del Mar, the, it's the baths down by the corner of Castillo and Cabrillo Boulevard in that beautiful Moorish Mission style. Two years later, architect John Austin gave us the Potter Hotel. 1906, local boy Francis Wilson, one of our great local architects, gave us the Santa Barbara uh, Southern Pacific Depot, also in this perfect Mission Revival style. 1911, Arthur Benton gave us the new Arlington Hotel. The previous Arlington Hotel, being of wood, had burnt to the ground, and so as not to have that experience happen again, this was built out of what they called hollow tile. And Mr. Benton is considered one of the great architects of the Mission Revival style. He did the Mission Inn down in Riverside, if you've seen that, and he did this one. Now this comes in here in the corner. Instead of just building a big box like so many big hotels were, this starts at the corner of State and Sola and comes at an angle through the block, comes here to the center, and so as not to have a problem with fire, they put a 60,000 gallon water tank at the top of that tower. That way they had great gravity feed, and in case of a fire or anything else, there was good pressure, no problem. This side here was the old part of the old Arlington Hotel that didn't burn down, and so they redesigned that, that mission style, and they put those Subway 7-Eleven domes on top of the edge, <laughs> edge corner there. So Santa Barbara was slowly moving towards this uh, design. But what really took off was in 1919 when a man named Bernard Hoffman brought his wife Irene and his family to Santa Barbara. Their youngest daughter, Margaret, had diabetes. They'd heard of the work of George Potter and of William Sansom, who succeeded Potter. And so they came to Santa Barbara, and I don't know where they got all these ideas from, but they hooked up with architect James Osborne Craig and his wife Mary, also an architect. And they bought property around the Casa de la Guerra, and they built what they called the De la Guerra Studios, which we know today as El Paseo. And Hoffman said, this is the blueprint for Santa Barbara. This is what you guys should be thinking. Here's a guy from back east who's been in Santa Barbara for a year or less, and has this grand vision of what Santa Barbara should look like. All utilities should be put underground. There should be open space around things. Hoffman also got uh, hooked up with George Washington Smith. They bought the Adobe just around the corner from us and built the Meridian Studios based around the Adobe, the same thing they did with El Paseo and the De La Guerra Adobe. At the same time, there was a group called the Community Arts Association, and Hoffman became the head or the chair of what was called the Plans and Plantings Department. And these guys, the best word I can think of them, uh, I forget whose name it was, the guy who's the state historian, Kenneth Starr. Kenneth Starr called them vigilante hispanicizers. And, <laughs> and they just sort of rode into town and just took it over. They hired their own consultants, their own planners, their own architects to design what a new Santa Barbara should look like. So powerful were they, they had their own architectural advisory committee. They started a, a board of zoning and had laws that they put together. The city council took it and passed it. And then they took a look at De La Guerra Plaza because the city hall was being torn down. And so they got their own architects to start putting up designs of what the city plaza should look like and the new city hall. So at the same time, we had Tom Stork, editor of the Santa Barbara Daily News. With George Washington Smith, they built the new Daily, the Daily News building at the one end of the plaza. So we had El Paseo at one end. We had the new Daily News building at the other end, followed by the new city hall. When this was built, the Community Arts Association's Architectural Advisory Board had full power over how the design went and how the building went to this building. In fact, the two architects that did this building, they had to pay the Architectural Advisory Board for their time and their information and their help. So that's how powerful the Community Arts Association was. Following this beautiful City Hall building, we had Santa Barbara High School with the same two architects that did City Hall. Followed by the Libero Theater, uh, George Washington Smith and Luda Maria Riggs, or vice versa, depending on which one you want to favor. <laughs> and so as Santa Barbara, oops, and so that's how Santa Barbara was starting to 
look by the, 19, by the, late, or the mid 1920s. But although these seeds had been planted, you know, then starting to germinate, there was really no room for them to grow. State Street was still cheek to jowl of these old brick buildings, this heavy ornamentation. We had so many different designs. We had old adobe still out there. We had, what do you call them, uh, board and, <coughs> board, thank you, board and batten wooden buildings, like little tiny western uh, saloons. And we had these massive, heavy ornament, ornamented, ornamental buildings. So as the summer of 1925 rolled around, we looked more like Toledo, Ohio than Toledo, Spain. Yeah. Well, on July, or in, sorry, June 18th, 1925, the new Hotel Californian opened at the corner of State and Mason, and the newspaper said it's gonna be a huge success because it's so close to the beach. It was also the only hotel on the beach at that time. It cost $100,000. It was built, as you can see, of brick. It was soundproof and it had 100 rooms, and each room had a bath and a telephone. So that was like, wow, nobody ever heard of things like that before. So it also had saltwater baths as well as freshwater baths. So success was uh, definitely on the horizon for them. The final week of June 1925 was a scorcher. On Friday, June 26th, it was 81 degrees. The next day on Saturday, it was 87 degrees. So people headed down to the beach this is the new, improved Los Banos. The other one, once again, being full of water and surrounded by water, somehow burnt down. And <laughs> the Edison Company built this replacement for it, which looked as they called it a Roman bath of antiquity in its design. So they kind of missed that more Santa Barbara look that we were going for. But nevertheless, the people came down to take the baths, listen to the bands, or perhaps stretch out on the beach below the bluffs of what is now City College and the Yacht Harbor parking lot. The next day on Sunday, things cooled down just a little bit, so people, of course, went to the mission, took in mass, tourists went up there. There was light rain uh, showers forecast for California, for Southern California, so it looks like everything was gonna cool off and be nice for the next day. Late night arrivals checked into the Arlington Hotel where Captain Alan Hancock and his ranch manager, Joe Chapman. They were headed up to the Hancock Ranch in Santa Maria and stopped off because it was so late in, at the Arlington Hotel. According to legend, the night clerk, recognizing Mrs. Mr. Hancock's name as an important realtor, oil man, and investor, upgraded his, upgraded his uh, rooms and gave him a suite up here in the tower. And there was, a couple, there was two rooms up there, and Mr. Hancock's son, Bertram, was following about an hour behind them. So they took, he and Joe Chapman took the one room and left the other one open for his son, who arrived around midnight. So... The night of June 28th, 1925, Santa Barbara went to sleep as the lights turned out. About 3.30 in the morning on early Monday morning, a slight earthquake rolled through Santa Barbara, but not too many people felt it. But the city manager, Herbert Nunn, woke up and said he could smell oil. He was on the bluffs, what is now sort of West Campus City College overlooking Ledbetter Beach. And he said he woke up because the smell of oil was so strong. He went outside thinking perhaps a wind is blowing up from Summerlin and bringing these oil vapors up, but he went outside and he said it was dead calm, very still, but the smell of oil was just overwhelming. Well, the sun rose at 449 and did its usual June chore of slowly burning off the fog to bring us a beautiful day, although farmers later noted that their animals had acted strange that morning. Birds were chirping oddly, dogs barking, cows doing whatever the cows do. At 6 o'clock, Mission Santa Barbara's bells rung, as they had done for well over 100 years, calling the faithful to church. It was the Feast of St. Peter's and St. Paul, so it was going to be a high mass. So for the 15 parishioners gathered in the church below, up in the choir loft was Father Holbrecht and four or five other brothers and fathers to sing the high mass. Behind them at St. Anthony's Seminary, a similar mass was going on with several of the seminarians and several of the fathers there uh, attending. Dr. James Engel, orthodontist, left his house at 32 East Islay and headed down to his office at the San Marcos building at the corner of State and Anapamu. Down below four stories in the basement, the building engineer, Sigismundo Mostiero, was turning on the furnaces, getting the chill off the night for the building to, so when the doctors arrived, it would be nice and warm. This is the place where all the dentists and doctors were. This was like Santa Barbara's medical clinic right there. A few blocks down, uh, at the train station, architect Julia Morgan had just stepped off the Lark from San Francisco. Under her arms were the plans for a new building called the, to be called the Margaret Baylor Inn. As she stood at the foot of State Street, 
waiting for the trolley to pick her up, she heard what sounded like a clap of thunder. And then as she looked up State Street, she could see each of the buildings exhaling little puffs of gray smoke. A veteran of the 1906 earthquake, she knew exactly what was happening and she was knocked off her feet as Santa Barbara was rocked and socked for 19 seconds. The last time I did this, we had everybody shake their tables at the, at the Westerners thing. So we'll count down 19 seconds. And when the shaking stopped, Santa Barbans looked out to a completely different Santa Barbara. This is the 300 block of state on the east side. It's now uh, underneath Highway 101. Up from uh, Haley Street, the 500 block of state. And you gotta give Santa Barbara credit. Whenever there's a disaster, we look good. <laughs> this guy's walking out in the debris with a carnation on, got his hat on, got his tie buttoned. Up to the 700 block of State, the southeast corner of De La Guerra and State Street, the uh, Rexall drugstore, with the one thing that no one needed in Santa Barbara that morning. <laughs> so yes, we had had an earthquake. Now it was estimated to be 6.5 on the Richter scale, but since the Richter scale hadn't been invented, they had to go with the, the damage that they saw and also things like this. This was the temperature chart from the Southern County's gas company. And because they have nice timers on it, we can see 3.30, there's the first shock that rolled through Santa Barbara. Nothing happened, blah, 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 blah. 6.43, so that's the earthquake followed by aftershock, aftershocks to about nine o'clock, it tapers off the small ones. A few here and there, one about seven o'clock at night and then we go backwards. There we go. So that's what the earthquake looked like recorded on the temperature uh, recording at the gas company. The earthquake was so strong it ripped the trolley tracks down along the beachfront. It tore open the roads and dropped the roads here and there several feet. The Sheffield Dam collapsed sending some 40 million gallons of water down Sycamore Canyon and flooding the lower east side and then rushing out to sea. It took with it 17 cows of a dairyman. Actually, it, it depends. There's different counts for how many cows died, but nevertheless, those were the uh, victims of the Sheffield Reservoir collapsing. A miraculous escape at the old mission. Well, up in the, this is what the corridor looked like for the Padres that came through the, above the uh, arched corridor section that came into the choir loft. This is what it looked like afterwards. Up in the choir loft, Father Holbert could hear the mission towers collapsing behind him, and prisoners were heading for the front door, and he yelled at them, stay where you are, don't, you know, it's, it's, the towers are collapsing. So somehow over the shaking and all the groaning and moaning, the people could hear him, so no one ran outside. So then when they tried to get out, they found the door blocked by this adobe collapsing, so they put their arms against the door and broke through. Of course, it was full of dust and dirt floating in the air, they couldn't really see that well. And there was two elderly brothers that were up in the choir loft. And so Father Holbrook took one of them, and ahead of him was Father, I forget who, with one of the other guys. They disappeared. He goes, where did they, where did they just go? Suddenly the brother in front of him that he was holding on to disappeared. And Father Holbrook is looking around. He took a step, and he said he just fell for eternity and landed in the room down below. The floor had collapsed from the adobe. He saw a stream of light coming in through the dust and realized that he was down on the first floor found the door handle, came outside, and walked in front of the mission. He said as he did so, another aftershock came through and shook the towers, and he said the bells were just sort of making a death toll sound as they just swung back and forth. He checked all the parishioners, and everybody seemed okay, but then someone came running from St. Anthony Seminary saying, Father, come quick. John Shea, who was one of the uh, lay brothers up there, had been leaving the chapel when that heavy sandstone wall collapsed hitting him on the shoulder and hitting him pretty bad. So Father gave him the last rites, and though they prayed their best for him, John Shea died, the first victim of the Santa Barbara earthquake. But death was not through yet because death checks into the Arlington. <laughs> At the Arlington Hotel, up there on the third floor, there was a woman, Edith Forbes Perkin, Perkins, her maid was in the adjoining suite and she heard her mistress call out to her as the earthquake struck. 
she said she opened the door, which we can see right about there. She said she opened the door just in time to see the room collapse in front of her. She said it was like listening to a locomotive followed by all the coal cars just crashing down around her, this thunderous noise. The door slammed shut, knocked her back into the room, and when she opened the door again, the tower was completely gone along with her mistress. Uh, Captain Hancock, the earthquake struck, and he was knocked out of bed, and the, the wall where he was collapsed, taking the floor with it. He said he saw his son's bed tumbling as the tower collapsed and was sure that his son was dead. Captain Hancock landed on the uh, patio down here with a piece of rebar piercing his shoulder and coming out the other side. A maid from the dining room helped him to his feet, and they were able to, with the help of a bellboy, get down to the lawn below. But he was sure that his son had died. And though people came through and scrambled and went through the wreckage of the hotel, yes, indeed, his son, Bertram Hancock, age 21, was dead. On the right, Edith Forbes Perkin, who lived part-time at the Arlington Hotel. She, too, had died. Deaths number two and three. At the San Marcos Hotel, life and death at the San Marcos building. Well, we knew Dr. James Engel was upstairs. And we knew that the engineer was in the building, turning on the furnaces. But no one knew if anybody else was up there. Was there a nurse? Were there patients? Were there other doctors had they arrived? So this is the San Marcos building. And you can see it, the section collapsed. As it was, when the San Marcos building was built, it was originally designed to be six stories tall. The city council wouldn't allow it. So they built it strong enough to hold the two extra stories. And originally, it was only stuck out onto Anapamu Street to that edge right there. This piece was added after 1915. But when the earthquake struck, the earthquake waves were going from east to west, although some say they went from west to east. Well, this corner here is the north pointing due north. So these two sides of the building were sort of grinding against each other like an obscene tango. And it just, grinding against each other, they just collapsed, taking down everybody that was inside of those corners. Oh. This is kind of a neat little thing I noticed. There's this little car sitting right there. I kept noticing this in all the photographs. And so when I got this photograph, I went, aha. It's both an ambulance. This is from the McDermott Mortuary. And at the time, the mortuaries ran the ambulance service as well as the hearse service. So if you didn't make it, you could go right to the mortuary. Or if you were looking OK, they could take you straight to the hospital. So sort of like a vulture or a jackal, it's waiting for one victim or another to uh, take down there. And you can see heavy equipment came to the San Marcos building. I don't know where they got this equipment from. I have tried so hard to figure out who had these giant cranes. And I've identified all the makes and models and years, but I cannot get a uh, company number off of them. So they're tearing through the San Marcos building. There was almost 100 volunteers in no time at all. And one guy said, I, th I think I hear something. So they turned off all the machinery, everybody stopped, and they listened, and they heard a woman's voice. So they started digging, and they found Mrs. Santiago Villamore. She was a janitress. She had been on the fourth floor cleaning when the building collapsed. She went down two floors and got pinned. There was a big beam came across and blocked her, and then another one landed just above her at an angle. And so as the building disintegrated, she was protected, but she was also trapped, so she couldn't move. And so depending on which newspaper you read, after they rescued her, she either had a broken leg, fractured ribs, or was just bruised and cut. But she lived. That was the important part. Well, despair now turned to hope as they dug frantically through the building. But by the time they got down by about uh, 1.30, 2.30, no, about 5.30 in the afternoon, they found Dr. Engel, and he was definitely dead. They also found the building engineer by Thursday afternoon, and he had been crushed, obviously. Being in the basement, he didn't have much of a chance. So on the left, we have Dr. James Engel and his wife, Emily. This is probably the last photograph taken of them. And he may or may not know it, but she is pregnant with their first child. And so I didn't know this until I was reading the papers day by day in our fabulous library, thanks to Michael Redman. I was going through the newspapers doing day by day research. Uh, and I found the thing in, in January 1926 that uh, Dr. Engel's, uh, the late Dr. Engel's wife has given birth to a baby who sadly shall never know her father. So I thought, wow, I wonder if she's still alive. So I started trying to find out about this woman, Emily Wallace. And I found that she got married. I knew where she went to school. But I had a dead end when she got married. I couldn't find anything about her. And then one night I was doing, uh, going through the you know, internet looking for this. And I came across a little notice from the Pasadena Polytechnic School, which had a thing about you know, all the alumni, what they're doing. 
it was two sentences. Emily Angle Wallace Schaefer, no, Emily Angle Schaefer Wallace took her two grandsons to Maine for vacation this last summer. Those two lines. I called the, hospital, the uh, school, left a message, sent them email explaining why I was looking for this woman and that I was not, you know, stalking her or anything. The next morning, about 9 o'clock, I got a phone call and a woman said, Hi, Neil, this is Emily Angle Wallace. Do you know what today is? I said, I sure do. It was June 29th, 2004, the 80th anniversary of the earthquake and her father's death. We became great friends, and I filled her in on what her, her father's activities in Santa Barbara. She has given me scrapbooks to go through of her father, and so we've got a great relationship going on. So she's still alive. She still drives a car, goes down to Pasadena, you know, drives from, she lives in Northern California, so great woman. The other gentleman I don't have a photograph for, Segismundo Mostero, and he was a Spanish family, he, a huge family. Uh, they married into the D'Alfonso's and the Sanchez family, but I have yet to be able to find a picture of the father or grandfather, depending which generation I'm talking to. So part of the deal for my book is I want to get photographs of all these people that died in the earthquake, because mostly all they ever talk about is Perkins, Hancock, and Angle, and all these other people are forgotten. And so part of my job in this book is to find photographs, and write the obituaries that these people never got to have. <laughs> Meanwhile, the grand opening of the Hotel Californian. Well, this is what it looked like before on the far left at the bottom, and that's what it looked like when they were done. It became an old hotel really quickly. Uh, great stories come out of the people that were in there. Uh, one man said that he remembered running through the front door or he, he saw a man and his daughter run out the front door as he was jumping out the window. He thought, why didn't he go to the front door? Well, he's panicking, doesn't know what's going on. He was still in his pajamas, and he said that he looked up at the top floor, and there was a naked fat man up there screaming at the top of his lungs for a taxi. <laughs> now, other fun things about the hotel, you can see these sheets hanging down here. And the story is that a lot of people couldn't get out of their rooms. The doorways were blocked, and so they had to tie sheets together and climb out of the hotel. So here's the Mason Street side looking towards State Street. This is the back of the hotel here. And you see all these sheets hanging down. Well, most of them aren't long enough to drop down to anything. It's not a good idea to be using those, but some of these are long enough. And I've been trying to figure out what the heck are these things. If the wall fell out, why would the curtain rod get jammed and stuck and stay in the hotel slightly hanging over, or towels? I haven't figured it out, but I've done close-ups on a lot of these and found that indeed some of these are tied together. This one here is tied to the radiator, so the guy had a slight drop to go down to this room. But this piece here is a piece of curtain, and there's a curtain ring holding it together, and there's the, the frayed uh, edges down there, the fancy edge of it. So there's no way they would have climbed down this thing that would have completely ripped. But I love it that up here, the dresser is completely flipped upside down. This one, there's a chair and table right up against the edge, which didn't move or flip at all. So weird things happen during the earthquake. The community responds. Well, nobody waited for FEMA back then. Everybody checked on their families, made sure that their families were OK, and they headed down to De La Guerra Plaza. Within an hour of the earthquake, the Red Cross had their first tent up in De La Guerra Plaza. A man visiting from out of town who was a doctor came up and said, can I help? Now they had a doctor and they had nurses. A man from the California hotel who was a Mason, uh, masonry guy saw, said, what can I do to help? And they're going, well, we're trying, to get hot, we're trying to get hot things, anything. Well, he went to this building over here, got a bunch of the bricks and made a quick little, built a quick little oven out of it, took all the kindling wood from the uh, board and batten and all the uh, lath boarding built little fire, so now they had a fire in an oven, and so now they're making coffee. And people are showing up. All the grocery stores had wagons coming in full of, full of groceries and produce to put into the De, De La Guerra Plaza. All the city department heads were at work by 9 o'clock. No one stayed home. They all came down, did their job. The water, there were two breaks in the water mains. They were fixed by 9.30, and there was water pressure enough that if there was a fire, the fire department had pressure and hoses. So everybody starts showing up. The Girl Scouts start running telegrams and messages for all the guys that are, or rather messages to all the guys that are working. Boy Scouts are delivering cupcakes and donuts, whatever they can get. So people are just all pitching in and doing things. So the Red Cross, you can see down this is De La Guerra Plaza, the Red Cross has their tent up. There's a few other city tents going on. Around the corner, the American Legion set up what they called their canteen, and also City Hall had their people uh, out there under tents. 
So De La Guerra Plaza was the scene of it. Those steel buildings were not damaged. You're correct. Uh, this is the Red Cross Canteen, as they called it, at the public library, the building between the old post office, now the art museum, and the very damaged library. And the Santa Barbara Yacht Club brought this giant canvas sail down to provide shade for them. You can see they've just got pieces of scrap lumber that they've dragged out to uh, prop the tent up. And you can see all the debris along the street here. This is from the San Marcos building. As the tractors pulled huge pieces of debris out, they just simply dragged them up Anapamu Street, dumped them, and went back to get more. Uh, they also had a canteen at the Arlington Hotel and another one down in Veracruz Park. So Santa Barbara was responding, just coming down like crazy. This is Police Chief Lester de Grandchamp. He had probably 40 policemen to count on for all the damage and everything that was going on on State Street. But he didn't realize it, but he had a far more larger force than he thought. The American Legion, the head of the American Legion was a man named Henry Ewald. If you remember Outdoors with Ewald in the old Santa Barbara news press, that's the same guy. He was the head of the American Legion in 1925. As he was walking from his home down State Street, he met other legionnaires. They quickly came up with a quorum and made a decision that we shall patrol the streets. So every time they found the legionnaire, they said, go home, get your rifle and come back. Pretty soon, Santa Barbara had a home guard of 400 guarding every intersection of State Street, Chapala Street, and along the business corridors, uh, Coda, Haley, etc. Also, the uh, Naval Reserve had their men come out, and they also donned their uniforms. This isn't one of the Naval Reserve guys, but you can see he's got his bayonet, and he's patrolling the San Marcos building. So pretty soon, Santa Barbara had a home guard of, of well over 400. Communication with the outside world, no one knew what was going on. There were rumors San Francisco was in flames. Los Angeles was completely leveled. There's the telephone company building being propped up, of course, by telephone poles. And you kind of think, <laughs> you got to look at this and think, how did they figure this is going to keep the wall from falling down? If there's an aftershock, these are just going to roll back and forth, but it looked really good, at least for the photograph. <laughs> so no telephone. The two um, telegraph companies, the lines were down, their buildings destroyed, so there was no communication. Well, luckily, there was a young Santa Barbaran who had moved away, uh, was back in town, named Brandon Wentworth. And he was with his friend Graham George up in Mission Canyon. The earthquake struck. They headed downtown like everybody else. And in what constitutes the first unrecorded, except by me, uh, looting in Santa Barbara was Mr. Wentworth. He went to Bolton and Jones Music Store in the 800 block of State Street and took out an RCA Victor radio that had batteries. They hooked up a quick uh, antenna for it, got the batteries working, and they started bringing in radio stations. Pretty soon there's a big crowd around them and they're yelling out what they're hearing. Uh, the first station they got was uh, radio station KFI in Los Angeles and Bill Handel was broadcasting as usual so they knew that there was nothing wrong in Los Angeles. There was no mention of an earthquake or anything else. So the next thing they did, they spread that word that okay, everybody else seems to be safe. These guys were ham radio enthusiasts. So the next thing they did was they put together a ham radio station. They went to their friend Benny Lopez's house on Santa Barbara Street. He was out of town, so they broke in and stole his ham radio set. <laughs> they also went down and got a Model T coil and some batteries out of a wreck Model T on State Street. And then they put together the little key, uh, what do you call that thing, the clicker, the telegraph key. And one guy, they, they put a wire to the trolley car tracks for a ground, and then some fool climbed up to the top of one of the buildings on State Street and ran an antenna up the flagpole. And so he got out his thing and started broadcasting SOS, SOS Santa Barbara, SOS Santa Barbara. Then he hears a reply. He hears two ships talking out in the channel. One of them says, did you feel the tidal wave and see the cliffs collapsing at Santa Barbara? The other one wrote back, no, we're too, a little too far offshore. So he's going, SOS, SOS. The one ship then hears them, and so they communicate. And the one ship was a standard oil tanker, and it was too big to pull into Santa Barbara. The other ship was a tugboat for the Merritt, Chapman, and Scott Company, which is the guys that ended up building our breakwater. And so they heard the message, and they said, we'll come in and tie up at Stern's Wharf. So at 2.30 in the afternoon, the tug Peacock came in and tied up the Stern's Wharf, and the mayor of Santa Barbara broadcast this on all frequencies for all channels, all stations. Santa Barbara suffered from severe earthquake shock that started at 6.40 a.m. and lasted intermittently for two hours. The principal damage is State Street, the main business street, where almost every business is damaged. There is probably some loss of life, but small. 
One or more people reported killed by buildings on State Street and two in the ruins of the San Marcos building. The main water supply at Gibraltar Dam is believed intact, though Sheffield Reservoir has gone out. We are well policed by the local force, Naval Reserves, and American Legion. The Red Cross is in active charge and established headquarters at several points, ready to care and feed for the needy. No call is sent out for help. It is believed the city can care for itself. I just find that stunning. The property loss is very large, but the city will rebuild bigger and better than before. Siam Andera, Mayor of Santa Barbara. So here's Brandy Wentworth uh, in a shot. And I'm not sure if this is recreated or not, because here we got a guard. Now, this is either a Naval Reserve guy in uniform or somebody that came the second day off the USS Arkansas. But there's his set. There's his radio, the RCA radio. The Bolton and Jones Music Company gave that radio to the city of Santa Barbara. And I don't know where it is now. I've asked a lot of people, have you looked in this city hall attic? We've got to find this radio. It should be around. This guy over here, bank stationery. That's Archie Banks of Bank Stationery in his Naval Reserve uniform. Communication with the inside world. Well, we had two newspapers back then, the, Daily, the Morning Press and the Daily News. And the new building of Tom Stork's Daily News was intact, but Stork would not let his employees, all of, empl all of his employees, of course, showed up. And they, uh, he wouldn't let them go into the building until engineers said the building was OK. So they did go into the building. They brought out some old hand type and an old hand press. And they put out the first Santa Barbara newspaper of the earthquake, uh, which immediately dispelled the rumors, saying sensational rumors are false and everything is okay, San Francisco, blah, blah, blah. And you gotta love Tom Stork. Already, 10 o'clock in the morning, he has written all the earthquake instructions, which you can and cannot do, and a beautiful editorial, which ends up by saying, in the end, Santa Barbara will come back bigger and better and stronger than ever before for the things that made this city and the men who built it are still here. So that, there was three editions he put out that day. Media frenzy. Well, things have not changed too much. Uh, by 10 o'clock, the first airplanes were coming over the city. And maybe some of you have seen the YouTube video of Santa Barbara at, from an airplane. There, uh, and that's from uh, some of the, the news agencies that sent planes over Santa Barbara to view the damage and record it. So here's a view looking up State Street, the California Hotel, or the Hotel Californian there, and the train tracks, the train depot up there. Well, these guys were all bragging who was the first to cover the news, who had the photographs first. Well, one of the great things about this disaster, this was the first time that a disaster was able to be sent to newspapers across the nation, or across the world, because uh, the wire photograph had just been perfected. And so supposedly, according to uh, legend, this is the first one. However, they were so quick to get this information out, they forgot a few details. Uh, this is State Street. There's the news press over there on the west side. There's David Gear Plaza. How did that happen? Well, they printed the picture backwards. <laughs> In further accuracy, the morning of June 29th, the San Francisco Call puts out this giant headline, Quake, Fire, 65, Die. Well, they were right about one thing. There was an earthquake in Santa Barbara. They also put, Huge water wall sweeps from sea over stricken city. Well, that would have put the fire out if that had happened. So uh, they, got, they got one thing right. The next day, they had a headline, New Earthquakes Peril Relief in Santa Barbara. Well, that was also wrong because we didn't need any relief. We didn't want any relief. Uh, they were sending railroad cars full of milk. We sent them back. They sent us a trainload of doctors and nurses from San Francisco. We sent them back. You realize that everybody had a garden, so there's tons of food coming to Santa Barbara from our own backyards and from Goleta, so no problem. Uh, they did note now that the uh, number of dead were down to 13 from 65. They didn't mention where those other bodies may have gone to. Uh, but there's also two more missing. And over here it says, oh, 200 orphans dodged death as Pembers wrecked gymnasium. Well, that was out at the St. Vincent's Orphanage on Calle Real and Cienegitas. And if you read the article, you find out, well, actually, had the orphans been awake and in the gymnasium when the earthquake struck, then they would have had to dodge death as the gymnasium collapsed around them. So just beautiful, sensational news across the United States. This one says guards doubled as looters raid quake, quake wrecked stores and offices. No, there was no looting in Santa Barbara. 
Uh, there was two guys arrested for looting, actually. Uh, one was the town drunk, who was well known, and they picked him up. Another guy was at the Arlington Hotel, tell, Arlington Hotel stealing women's clothing. And, uh, you know, he, he, this is where you insert your Bruce Jenner joke if you, if you want to. <laughs> the other thing that this article, which is a little bit out of focus on my part, uh, they mentioned that the, the Cathedral of St. Anthony's was robbed. Well, we don't have a Cathedral of St. Anthony's. We have a, the, the church up behind the mission. That also mentioned that Our Lady of Guadalupe was robbed of priceless vestments, chalices, and silver, silver candlesticks. Well, that turned out to be that the milkman had gone up to the front of the church, picked up the empty bottles in the rack, and put it in the back of his truck. From there, that spread out to a story that, this, that he had robbed all the vestments and chalices out of the, out of the place. So uh, we also had news media here. This is, we had two, at least two people that were recording the earthquake with their cameras. One was Bob Phelan, who was a former Flying A photographer, and his camera is here at the museum, and he used that camera to record a lot of the earthquake damage. He lived in the 500 block of State Street, walked outside, started shooting. This guy's name uh, is Roy Kafke. He was also a Flying A photographer, and he's out, and I can tell from the damage that this is the second day of the earthquake. And he's out there recording it. So now I'm taking, I've got about 80 of his still photographs, and I'm matching them up to all the different newsreels that I've seen to be able to tell if Kafke took those shots or if it was somebody else. So we were well covered. Dos Heroes. This is the Santa Barbara electric plant in what is now uh, Pershing Park. And as you can see, it collapsed quite uh, heavily, and made out of that delightful local brick. Inside was the night watchman, or the night engineer, a man named uh, William Engel, no relation to Dr. James Engel. Uh, Engel ran across the building as it was collapsing to pull the switch to cut the power to Santa Barbara. As a result, there was no electricity as buildings collapsed and flammable things could happen. At the same time, a man named William or Henry Ketch was at the Southern Counties Gas Company. He shut the gas off to the plant, as, or to the city, as the plant collapsed around him. For their uh, activities, for their hero, uh, heroic efforts, they got $1,000 each. Mr. Ketz also got a silver watch, which he's being presented with there. And he also got silver service. I found his family, and I've got a photograph of the watch and of the silver service, which we will, of course, include with my new book. There's also another man. Um, is Daisha in here? I, I can't pronounce this guy's name, but she knows him with the same last name. A guy named William Falenging or something. He, there's a policeman in town with the same name. Oh, Flang. Flang, thank you. And he. Uh, also was at the gas company and turned stuff off, but he didn't seem to get $1,000 or a gold watch. So he's, he's mentioned as being a hero, but he didn't get the, uh, the goods. The, the not so fortunate. This is Ralph Litchfield. He was uh, working for Shell Oil out of San Luis Obispo. He came down to Santa Barbara that day, the day before to work on opening this third Shell gas station in Santa Barbara. Unfortunately, he was in the 500, the, or the, uh, I forget which block this is. Anyway, yeah, 500 block of State Street on the east side. He was either up here in the hotel or down below here in the cafe when the earthquake struck. And as he came out in front, the whole front collapsed and landed on his Model T Ford, which I have in this picture here. So one of those Model Ts is his. Um, a policeman on the second day of the earthquake was walking along and saw this boot, and he thought it was somebody's shoe, and so he pulled on it and found a leg attached to it, so that was Mr. Litchfield. I found his family up in Watsonville, and so that's where I got these photographs from them. And his uh, niece was still alive at the time and was just blown away that I was doing this research on her family. The five more that died that gave us our grand total of 11, William Proctor, Demetrios James Stavro. Uh, he was a Greek partner of the great Sam Shorty Veliotis, who uh, had many restaurants in Santa Barbara. Uh, Stav Stavro went out the back exit and the building collapsed on him. It's where Zello's used to be on State Street is for the location for that. Merced Leone is a local guy. I have found his family but no photograph. Gerardo Chavez was a Mexican laborer up from Mexico. He, uh, Leon, Chavez, and Gomez all died when the Central Hotel at State and Haley collapsed and killed them. This guy has this weird name, Marabamima, I can't even pronounce it. You can imagine what the newspapers did with this name. They had a field day with it. Uh, it turned out he was an escaped convict from Mexico, and so that's why he had two names. However, he was buried at Calvary Cemetery with this name, this name, 
and that name. Mrs. Chavez did not have a grave site. In 2004, I went to Santa Barbara Monumental, talked to Jed Hendrickson, and uh, we got four headstones made for Mr. Proctor, Mr. Leon Chavez, and Gomez, and Santa Barbara Cemetery and Calvary Cemetery, no charge at all, installed the headstones for us. So these guys had unmarked graves for 80 years, so we finally got them headstones. Of all the deaths, the most tragic was the amazing death and resurrection of Hap Hazard. That first edition of the Santa Barbara Daily News noted that H. Hazard had been found dead. And of course, to Hap Hazard's many friends in Santa Barbara, they were completely destroyed and distraught by that news, as were his friends throughout California when the news hit the national papers. But no one was surprised more than Mr. Hazard himself on Tuesday morning when he read the paper and found that he was deceased. He took a full scale of himself in the mirror and thought he looked okay, so he walked over to the morning press to have them appraise his appearance and see if he was okay. And so he told the guys at the press, you know, boys, it doesn't work to take your jacket off in Santa Barbara while you're doing you know, rescue work. He had taken his jacket off, hung it up on a shovel, it got knocked down and, and debris and trampled. Somebody came along, picked up this jacket from the debris. Haphazard's jacket, oh my God, he's buried beneath us. Meanwhile, he's over there shoveling away. So Mr. Hazard was pronounced to be among the living and continued to amaze, astound, and, en and enthrall Santa Barbans for the next 40 years. To the rescue. Well, the president heard about the Santa Barbara earthquake and immediately called the Secretary of the Navy and they sent the battleship Arkansas to Santa Barbara. It arrived Tuesday morning, about 2.30, and immediately the sailors set out patrolling the streets. This was actually really good because Santa Barbara was running on pure adrenaline because these guys had been patrolling the streets for almost 24 hours. They also sent in a team of doctors and nurses and they went up to the cottage hospital to, the, to relieve the doctors and nurses there. And so they stayed for about 24 hours, and then seeing that Santa Barbara was doing quite well, plus a destroyer, a Coast Guard cutter, a Navy tugboat, and a early PT boat called an Eagle boat had also arrived by Wednesday. And so Santa Barbara was flooded with sailors and with help. So the Arkansas departed. Now, the one thing I have never found is a photograph of all of these ships out in the roadstead in Santa Barbara Harbor, outside of the harbor. You would think with a battleship, a destroyer, a Coast Guard cutter, there'd be photographs, but I have yet to find a photograph showing any of these, any of these ships. But we do have the sailors patrolling the streets and uh, making sure that everything is safe for us. We also had the Marines arriving on Wednesday afternoon, and so 500 Marines came up from Camp Pendleton. Much to the delight of the Santa Barbarans that were awake when they came through, they double-timed it through Santa Barbara along with all of their gear and set up camp in the dark at Peabody Stadium. So that was their headquarters, as you can see over the, the brand new Peabody Stadium, I might add. In the morning, the trucks delivered them all through Santa Barbara to key points and intersections where they took car guard of Santa Barbara's most precious access or assets, the bays. I mean, you think what those sailors could have done with our girls, so thank God the Marines were here to protect them. <laughs> oh, now you can also see what happened to Our Lady of Sorrows. Remember that nice adobe church that was in there? They covered it with brick, all the brick to shed off, and here's the new bell tower they put on in 1904. The bells that they put in there were so heavy that they couldn't connect them to the bell towers. So you can see this, this lumber in here. They built a framework completely independent of the brick and the adobe, so when the bells rang, they weren't touching any of the walls because they thought the vibration would shake it down. So the earthquake shook it all down for them. So you can just see this one's just hanging up here. The other one completely had collapsed. Uh, there's the Marines on State Street. A man whose name I'm just forgetting all of a sudden, he wrote a bunch of books about growing, oh, Spalding, wrote a book about growing up in Santa Barbara. I believe it's in our gift shop. Is that true, Lynn? Thank you. You can buy it there. He talks about uh, the Marines coming to Santa Barbara and how different it was because up to that point, if you were crossing State Street in your car, you knew the Home Guard and the Naval Reserve guys, and they'd say, you can't cross State Street, stop. And you kind of let off in the clutch, and you just roll forward slightly going, well, you know, I just got to get to the side. We can't cross the street. Well, you're halfway across it. Just go across and don't come back. He said when the Marines were here, and you, they came up to the intersection, they put their bayonet through the window right at your throat. So if you let off on the clutch and rode forward, you'd slice your own throat. So State Street was closed unless you had the pass to get through. The Marines did not uh, take any nonsense. Meanwhile, back home, most of the houses in Santa Barbara had about $100 worth of damage. 
One thing, if you look at old photographs of Santa Barbara, you see really tall chimneys on the houses. After the earthquake, they're a lot shorter because one, the building code said no tall chimneys, but also the chimneys would break uh, through the earthquake and fall through the roof. So that was the worst damage was chimneys going through the roof. Also, houses walked off their foundation. You can see that this house here, there's the fireplace, and there's a house up, what, five feet away. So that's why we're supposed to tie our houses to our foundation so that they don't walk off the foundation like this house did. This house, the whole front completely peeled off, and I'm amazed at how well that second floor is not bowing in an inch, it's just straight across. The dresser and the mirror are in perfect shape. There's no walls, but the dresser and mirror are exactly in, in great shape. What's also of interest to me is following the earthquake, all the different trades put out publications saying, brick is the best. The Santa Barbara earthquake proved it. So they have brick buildings that were intact, ignoring all the brick buildings that disintegrated. The same with the, uh, the uh, hollow tile people, with the concrete people, all of them said, we were the best for the earthquake. And the one thing that was great, I forgot to mention about these guys that turned off the power and gas to the city. This was the first time that an earthquake had hit a, a large city like this with no fire. The worst thing for San Francisco was not the earthquake, it was the fire. And the same with Yokohama in 1923. So now seismologists and engineers could take a look at all the buildings, see how they reacted to each other, what worked and what didn't work. And so this was the first time they had a completely open plate that they could uh, dine off of to see you know, how to improve things. Most families camped outside for the summer, even though electricity was on a week later. Uh, because of the danger of aftershocks and the gas pipes breaking, so most people camped out. Talking to kids who are now uh, in their almost in their hundreds, they said, most of them said it was a great time for them because they camped out in the backyard all summer long. And they got to, of course, run donuts and coffee to all the men working, though the donuts sort of disappeared halfway to the uh, work sites. So the people pretty much had a, a good time according to the uh, survivors of that. And finally, we have, of course, any disaster deserves souvenirs. And these souvenirs were printed up within a week of the earthquake, the first souvenir book that came into Santa Barbara. The Chamber of Commerce was furious about it, but since it was uh, Schold Printing, I forget which printing company it was, or the Ramona Bookshop that did the first one, they sent the photographs to Chicago by teletype or whatever the wire that service that is, got them printed and it was back in. And there's probably five or six different uh, brochures you can get. You can also get postcards. Edwin Rick and Dwight Falding did a landmark business printing up postcards and selling them to the tourists. Here's uh, outside the California Hotel. Postcards are five cents. Buy them in a series. Pictures tell the story. Uh, you can identify almost every one of these cards and see what they are. This guy here, we don't know if he's Edwin Rick or not. Uh, Brian Bird, who's done a lot of uh, research on this, doesn't think it's Rick. But anyway, those two guys produced tons of postcards uh, covering the event. And of course, there was tourists. When Charles Presley, who was the head of the Business uh, Men's Association on State Street, found out that the Ventura police were holding back 300 cars and 1,000 people that wanted to come up and look at this disaster, he said, let them in. We want the business. And so everybody came up to get their picture taken happily with the ruins of Santa Barbara. Did you go to church on Sunday? Yes, we did. So the uh, recovery of Santa Barbara, like we said, there was no FEMA back then. Everybody just took care of themselves. Newspapers across the country focused on the Santa Barbara mission, that it was not a Catholic church. It was part of California and our nation's history. So regardless of their faith, people everywhere donated money to help rebuild Mission Santa Barbara. The railroads were taken to task in many editorials because for years they'd used the mission in their advertising for free. Now it was their turn to pay back the mission, so they got to give like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a piece to help rebuild Mission Santa Barbara. And then we had the mayor promising the city will rebuild bigger and better than ever before. And this was a nice uh, uh, editorial cartoon that went out across the nation. And sure enough, it did. Uh, a, these, once again, the Community Arts Association, working with the Allied Architects, started putting up designs for State Street. Some of the stuff they had done in 1919, much earlier, when they were putting together their plans for Santa Barbara. So now they're able to put these plans out in the papers and say that anybody that chooses to use this design for their State Street building can have them for free. And so, of course, all these buildings were sort of intact, just the fronts fell off. So they just put up these new facades. So a lot of the buildings on State Street that you go into, and you see those bare brick walls sometimes in the stores, 
Those date back to the 1870s and 1880s, and it's just that new Spanish front they put on. As a result, this was the beautiful Santa Barbara that rose up, and thanks to many preservationists and watchdog groups, it has stayed looking like this, although we always have to worry about the next quake because the devil of the quake is always ready and waiting to take us. We have a question. Where did they take all the rubble? Where did they take all the rubble? That's a good question. Uh, from many of the stories that I've heard, Santa Barbara had that lower east side, and it was all a swamp lagoon. A lot of it got dumped in there. Uh, Santa Barbara Junior High School is, on, is built on fill from the earthquake underneath it. So it's all kind of a swampy area, but they, they dumped a lot of the debris in there. Yes? I want to about the population at that time. What was the size of Santa Barbara? Uh, Santa Barbara was about 25,000 people uh, in 1925. And the, the beauty of it is, why, one reason we didn't need all that help was like everybody had a garden, so they had fresh vegetables. Goleta was all orchards and ranches, so fresh produce, fresh meat was easy to get to come into Santa Barbara. So that's kind of why we did so well. I don't think we would, you know, once Gelson's and uh, Vaughn's are cleaned out, I don't know how things are going to go. Uh, yes? Where is the uh, devil? Uh, oh, the devil of the quake. That is the famous Castle Rock that we saw at the be toward the beginning of the show. And uh, Edwin Rick saw this shape that was on the side of the rock after the earthquake. Parts of it fell down, so he made this card, the devil of the quake. And so that's, uh, that's where that came from. Uh, Betsy. In one of the newspaper articles, it mentioned uh, a nurse in the list of uh, mortalities. Yes. Was that a mistake? Or that, was a, that was a mistake. Um, there was, uh, it was supposedly a nurse, and <laughs> I've, I've got a page, of, I've probably got two pages of names of all the people listed as injured, missing, and dead, and wheedled them down to actually 11 people were killed. And this nurse that they mentioned was a, comp uh, a composition of two different names. One woman's maid and a doctor's last name, and it was said that she was thrown from St. Francis Hospital's second floor to the ground below and died, and no such person ever existed. And so, yeah, no nurse. Yeah, another, another media frenzy piece. Yes? How long was it until the town really looked pretty normal again, especially in the States? I would say within a year's time. Um, Part of the book has a whole part of the aftermath of, of all these great drawings in the morning press and daily news showing buildings that I, I had no idea that they got their start in the earthquake. But that's what built Santa Barbara. Um, that earthquake leveled all that stuff, new buildings came in. So by 26, and actually uh, exactly one year to the day, there was another earthquake on, January, on June 29th, 1926, and a boy was killed when a chimney collapsed and went through the roof. So that one had one fatality. Uh, yes? Luck. <laughs> I, I do know, like, for the California Hotel and a lot of the things on State Street, they had wood frame interiors with the brick on the outside, but they weren't structurally put together. So wood moves, brick yes. does not. So the California Hotel, they just simply hammered the walls out, and the same with all those things on State Street. But some buildings, perhaps because the building next to them shook more and took more shock, their building didn't take as much shock, or perhaps the, their foundation was better. I talked to Art Sylvester, the uh, geologist out at UCSB, about why Mission San Fernando did not get hit by the big quake that destroyed San Juan Capistrano, but San Juan Buenaventura felt the shock. Why didn't San Fernando ray? And he said, well, there's different types of rock formations, and so they may be built on something more solid. So the seismic waves went around, went up this, you know, almost like a channel of water around an island. So it's uh, all hit and miss. Yes, way in the back. Uh, the fault line supposedly was, I think it's called the Mesa Fault. It, no, it's not. No, Betsy, <laughs> Betsy writes the Mesa column, so she says it's not their fault. Uh, it runs. <laughs> this fault, this fault runs from Mission Creek by Stearns Wharf, all the way through the west side, out along through uh, Santa Barbara. What's the uh, junior high school out there called? Lacumbra Junior High School, 
and then out to Robinson's Lacumba Plaza, there it meets another fault that comes in at an angle, and so they thought that was the one that slipped, but no one can be sure because they don't have any pure records, but that's what the uh, speculation is, that it was the, the Mesa fault running through there. Possibly. And there, I, just don't, I just don't know because I've had so many people say it was this fault, that fault, and others say, oh, no, it couldn't possibly have been. But somebody, it was somebody's fault. Betsy, you're again? It seems like this sort of an event in this town would have engendered a lot of poetry or songs or something. Yes, there is a song, and I think we've got it up in the museum. Is that right? A man oh, named oh, Vernon Dahlhart. And that takes up two pages in my book alone. This guy was the most prolific songwriter, and he recorded under all these different names. I don't know why, but he did a song called The Great Santa Barbara Earthquake. And the, the lyrics are great. When I did this talk in 2004, I think some of you were at the Victoria Street Theater when I did it, I got Peter Feldman and David West to come on stage and do the song. I was going to do it here, but I just didn't have time. No, I didn't have time. I could probably try and take it. Uh, it's a, it I, obviously that Vernon Dahlhart had never been to Santa Barbara when you read some of the words that, uh, for the lyrics on that. But you can buy that album. Uh, it's still available. He's a great prolific writer, great story. Um, and there is uh, some poetry. We have another, yes, way in the back. That is correct. Yes, it was. He asked about the trolley that went along State Street, and I think, I don't have my timeline in front of me, but I, uh, I know that within a week to two weeks, the trolleys were running again. They got motorized buses up from Los Angeles within the first week, so there was bus service through the destroyed city, and then they got the electricity back on, and the trolleys were back up and running. Although by the late 20s, I think it's 29, was the last trolley ride, and buses took over from there, and the tracks were buried. Yes, again to the back. Yes, they did. Good question. Thank you. Uh, they felt it in Los Angeles. They didn't know where it was, but they felt the rolling of it. And also north of California, I know that up in Naples, the church collapsed up there. It was felt up in Santa Maria, Guadalupe. And I forget how much further up than that. Again, a good plug for the book. I've got all the recordings of where it was felt. And I think that's a section called, Did the Earth Move for You Too, Honey? <laughs> okay, thank you very much.